AWS Loft Talks. You know, I'm co-founder and CTO at Sumo Logic. We've been at it since 2010. Sumo Logic is a machine data analytics, or in other words, log management service. I was previously at a company called ArcSight for quite a while, uh, which was doing um, log management for security. And so that's kind of my background. Uh, sort of ended up doing lots of stuff with logs. And, uh, you know, machine data is a fancy term today. So what does Sumo Logic do? We like to think of ourselves as the machine data analytics cloud. We want to have a better product, a better service for making machine data useful. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what, what machine data is in a little bit more detail in a second. We find that our product resonates a lot with folks that are, that are doing DevOps, IT ops. Um, and there's a good amount of security and compliance use cases there as well that we can address. We are all in with AWS. We started in 2010, so it's basically been five years now. And uh, we have uh, a pretty solid amount of paying customers and a large amount of folks that use our you know, free tool, you know, free Sumo, to basically you know, get started on log management without the hassle of having to you know, run their own infrastructure. Very quickly, just to give you a little bit more context, you know, how do we define machine data? Well. Machine data is actually data that's generated by machines. This is actually the biggest and fastest growing data set that's there. You can look at all the various machine data. The data that machines generate while they do what they do grows faster today than any other data set, including data generated by humans. So it's quite interesting. A lot of people are talking about big data. We sometimes like to think of machine data or logs, really, as the original big data. All of the, you know, the, the you know, the Classic definition applies, it's a large volume, lots of variety, and uh, it comes at you basically in real time, so high velocity as well. And, and of course, you know, it's not done yet. Uh, you know, with just you know, running computers and that kind of stuff, uh, the Internet of Things is upon us. We'll see exactly how and what and when and how much, but it's very clear that this, uh, you know, this idea of everything being networked, everything being uh, you know, driven by, by machines is going to continue. So that's the context. So I said we started a company in 2010, and based on our experience in the space, and you know, this is just one of the things I guess that we sort of intuitively knew, we knew that if we were going to be successful, it would look basically something like this. In other words, it was going to be huge. So again, based on intuition, we had this sort of thought and we had this kind of sense that we needed to do things a little bit differently. For us to be successful means we need to process more data because that's how we charge folks. You send us more data, more logs, more machine data. For us to be successful means that we need to figure out how to scale. So scale is absolutely critical for this type of endeavor that we're doing. And you know, this is not, uh, you know, not, this is not so different from what, for example, coding is doing. You know, more successful, more VMs, more management, all of these kinds of things. We come from an enterprise software development background. We knew we had to somehow figure out how to build a distributed system. And we knew if it was going to be successful, the distributed system that we were going to build was going to be of rather extreme scale. You know, that was a good intuition to have because that turned out to be true. So I'm kind of glad that we sort of quote, quote unquote knew this in the beginning. And we knew that we had, as you know, developers and designers and you know, architects, I guess, that we had to evolve. And you know, that we had to sort of embrace this extreme nature of what we were going to build. And so this is the scale that we actually went through, you can see it's actually growing almost exponentially. We are currently processing on the order of 35 terabytes of data per day across all of our customers. And, uh, you know, we're not just ingesting data, we're also making it available for analytics. And, you know, the measure that we have there, the metric that we have there is, is how many search queries are actually being run uh, any, any given day. And, you know, this is basically way past a million. So, um, you know, think of that as a you know, big database in the cloud uh, for unstructured data that's running literally millions of queries per day across uh, a large set of users. So uh, we're pretty proud that we actually managed to get there. It wasn't easy. Um, uh, a little bit scared as to <laughs> what's going to happen next, uh, but it kind of adds to the fun, right? So you need to be ready for an extreme rate of change. So how can you be ready for an extreme rate of change? One way, and if you can, stand on the shoulders of giants. In this particular giant, is probably well known to you. Uh, this is Werner, obviously, from AWS. There is stuff that you probably shouldn't be doing yourself. Try to minimize the area of impact for change, and so you can move faster. So from our perspective, you know, that's just our history. We are not data center people, we're not infrastructure people, we're developers. AWS has turned the data center into an API. 
That's what in many ways enabled us to even think about doing this company because we knew we were going to have to scale. And I haven't seen a data center in I don't know how many years. So this idea of reuse is something that comes naturally for us as developers. You know, we write applications, we don't necessarily write OSs. Right? And even the people who write OSs, most of them don't start by writing their own compilers first. There are some of those, right? But in the overarching you know, majority, people are reusing lots and lots and lots of stuff, many layers of abstraction. Basically, the way that I look at it is that today's systems, distributed systems, you know, systems that are going to thrive, you know, your, your growth, you know, the, the business of your company, they will end up being you know, distributed. And, and the reuse that you're already used to just happens at a higher level. Now we're using infrastructure. Maybe you're reusing on, uh, something on top of that infrastructure, like a managed service, DynamoDB, these kinds of things, right? So we actually saw Werner talk in 2008, in 2008 in Stanford, when he was coming around, and we didn't even know what this cloud thing was. It's just like, this sounds kind of interesting. And so we went there, and he did a, this 90-minute you know, presentation, basically running through all of the use cases, even in 2008, that they already had, scaling Animoto, you know, all of these things. And we realized that it was giving us this incredible power you know, to come up with a way to solve this problem that we've been trying to solve, in this particular case as part of ArcSight, you know, as enterprise software, in potentially a much better way. You know, by getting back control over running the system and, on, and all of these things. So, you want to look at this as a way to decompose vertically. You know, you want to make sure that all the different bits of your application can be scaled independently. And you, will, you know it's a live system, so this grand rewrite version 2 is never going to happen. Trust me, you know, I've been wanting to do it many times. You know, it doesn't happen in enterprise software, and it sure as hell does not happen in a service. So what you need to do is you need to be able to ultimately take bits and replace them. Sometimes maybe a little bit more brutal, sometimes not so brutal. Going back and forth, you know, changing parts in order to advance the whole. Your infrastructure becomes refactorable. That's actually pretty cool. At least that makes sense to me as a developer. And then... Ultimately, what we're doing is we're just building, you know, highly cohesive, loosely coupled systems, just on a higher level. Now it's services instead of objects, right? And we've heard this before, right? This, you know, highly cohesive, loosely coupled business. You know, that's believed to be good design practice. And this goes all the way back to when people were starting to invent object-oriented programming, which is, you know, what most of us, you know, to some degree, still practice. Some more, some less, you know, but. Uh, you know, this is what a lot of us have learned in terms of how to structure systems, how to structure applications. And uh, my point is that it's the same thing. It's just on a higher level of abstraction now. And this is why this decomposition business is important because, you know, it, it, it jibes with the mindset that you already have as a developer in particular. And it also gives you all of these advantages uh, in terms of being able to make, you know, to change things, you know, uh, on the fly and, 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 and so forth. So, number three, software-defined software. As you're building services, which is what we're doing today, not microservices, but a service as the whole system that provides, you know, the application to the user, that provides the product to the users. If you're looking at it from a developer and from an architect's perspective, it's not just the application anymore. It's the runtime environment. It's the entire thing. Everything that basically starts somewhere where, you know, the infrastructure that you reuse ends, right? And so the point is that you, know, you build, that's my, that's my view anyways, and that's what we've learned, we really need to take into account delivery to production, what happens when you run things in production. Um, we want to offload most of this. We don't really want to rack and stack and so forth. And, you know, maybe when we do monitoring, we'll use a monitoring service for that. But we, this is part of the architecture of the system. So ultimately, what is that? That's software again, right? So the system that I'm building gets deployed and you know, delivered and, and you know, monitored and so forth by other software. And you know, I need to be willing to write some of that software myself. In 2010, there, there, there was no etcd. There was no service discovery. So we had to write our own. Today, probably we'll just use that, right? And then we'll find something else that nobody else has done yet. And so then we need to do that. You know, that's kind of how you evolve. Um, like coding, we have our own deployment layer. We don't use Chef or Puppet or anything like that just because at the time we needed something and you know what was out there was just not quite there yet. So um, ultimately what we ended up doing is we use our skills. In our case, it was mostly software development. 
and applied them towards the idea, not just of an application, but a product as a service. Right? And this is one of the points I'm trying to make is that as you evolve as designers and you know, software designers and architects and so forth, uh, you know, basically going down that route of becoming better developers, you need to keep that in mind, in my mind anyways. So stuff that we've done that we've built ourselves, uh, we have our own health monitoring thing, we build ourselves this little um, you know, web UI that does a whole lot of things, but uh, among other things, it basically shows us when alerts fire on any on our given machines, right? So, you know, if we had an infra background, we would probably have used Nagios, uh, you know, but we took one look at Nagios, I think, and it was written in some sort of ancient language, I think Perl probably, and uh, that, just didn't, that, that just didn't sit well. So, so we did this ourselves, and this is the same people that built the application, that built the product, built all of this stuff that supports, you know, all of the runtime and configuration aspects, in this particular case, uh, you know, alerting, and the point that I'm trying to make here again is that, hey, we have an alert, we link it to a playbook, we click on that, we go to a GitHub page that basically describes what this particular alert means, and it also includes the steps to remediate it. You know, as far as it can be automated, it'll be in there. As far as a human has to go through things, it'll be described there, updated, and so forth. And then we wrote a big old tool that we call Deploy Shell that basically deploys all the code that we use to manage and operate production. And this particular one ended up being a command line. You know, because when you operate stuff, to your point, about people with the, you know, green terminals and stuff, you know, that's really what you want. You don't want to click and right-click and these kinds of things. So we actually wrote more code to actually get all the code that we wrote to actually run. The other thing that you want to think through is multi-tenancy if you're building a service. Ultimately, you will get better economics out of that. If you're building a service as a, you know, per tenant, you know, uh, you know, thing that you need to spin up, the, the old application services model, uh, you have essentially per customer cost, you know, that can be ultimately a very damaging when it comes to competition. So with a wink, we say customers are cattle, not pets. This is the uh, kind of transposed from a DevOps saying where basically people talk about you don't want to look at your individual machines in your racks as pets and you know every them by name and you know all the hairy details, look at them as fleets, as cattle, etc. I think we also need to look on some sort of dehumanized level, of course, but we need to look at our, at our customers as cattle, and we need to make sure that we don't actually get stuck with them having all these kinds of one-off customizations and so forth. So, you know, if you're building something in a multi-tenant fashion, you are pretty much making that impossible, and that's a good thing. And then the other thing, and that's where the economics come into the picture, it's actually interesting. Across all of our customers, the load on the system is relatively stable. Of, of course, it goes up over time, but on any given day, it's pretty much, uh, pretty much stable. However, the load of any given individual customer fluctuates wildly, right? So if you always have to provision for each individual customer's peak in that particular week, you're going to constantly over-provision, and that's going to cost you money, and you're going to ask your customer for money, and eventually they will not want to pay that anymore. And then you basically destroy your margins. So multi-tenancy allows you to oversubscribe, and that's a very cool thing. Just a typical customer, customer profile. This is what we see all the time in our customers, and this is why the multi-tenancy aspect is so important. 8x variance. Now, the point is, if you are a customer and you need to do that yourself, or if you are building a service that is not multi-tenant, then you're probably going to assume some sort of upper bound for the amount of you know, load or data or CPU or whatever it is that the customer will need you provision for that, you know, this is all flushed down the toilet. This is money, you know, that somebody else will get. And then the other problem is, here, you'll actually fail. Because probably nobody in their right mind will over-provision by 8x, right? So, that's the story of the multi-tenancy. Quick summary. If you want to become an extreme architect, stand on the shoulders of giants, reuse ruthlessly. Figure out what you can use, fill in the planks. And that will change over time. Everything you do will become instant legacy. Apply the same principles that you apply when you try to design a pure software application. You know, decompose. Decompose into services. Next level of abstraction. Don't be shy to write software. You already know how to write software. Write more software to run the software that you write. That works for us anyways. And multi-tenancy is very important. This model makes it possible. And it'll make it much easier for you, especially if you're sort of in the data processing space where, you know, load actually matters. It turns into real dollars that you need to pay. Multi-tenancy is pretty much, in my mind, the only way to do this. Thank <laughs> you.
AWS Loft Talks.